Good morning, everyone. My name is Deborah Tanjis, and I'm the youth minister here at OSLC. I want to welcome all those gathered here today for worship, both here at our Tacoma campus, as well as those joining us online. We would love for everyone worshiping with us this morning to fill out a connection card by either scanning the QR code that you see on your screen or by going to go.oslc.com cc. If this is your first time worshiping with us, we want to welcome you and let you know that we have a special gift just for you at the connection counter located in the lobby. As we begin our time of worship this morning, I want to let you know that if you have any other questions or want more information about any of our ministries here at Our Savior Lutheran Church, check out our central hub at oslc.com or download the OSLC app at oslc.com app. It's time to worship, so let us prepare our hearts and minds to experience the true love and forgiveness that God brings to us through His body and blood, His holy word, and the lifting up of songs of praise as a thank you for what He has done. Yeah. 
Hey, good morning. You can have a seat. My name's Matt. I'm one of the pastors here at Our Savior. And I am Deborah, and I am the uh, youth minister. My brain was thinking just discipleship team. Um, and we are so excited to join with you in worship. And today we are celebrating first communion of 14 students. We already had some celebrate in our first service, but we are excited to join together to celebrate this faith milestone as we um, just recognize how God is working in the lives of young people and throughout the generations. And this is just one step, one milestone in this journey with Christ. And it's so amazing, right, that God gives gifts that are so good and so transcendent that generation to generation, he is faithful. And what a joy today that we get to celebrate that together. So welcome to worship. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Pastor Tim, and we do gather around this meal, and it's a sacrament. We, we believe it's a mystery. We don't quite understand everything, but we know God is here. So we hear on the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, he gave thanks, and he broke it. He gave it to his disciples as he said, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way also, after supper, he took the cup. And after he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and he said, Drink of it, all of you. This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood given for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Now may the peace of the Lord, may it be with you always. Let's uh, bow our heads and maybe even just close our eyes. Our servers are going to prepare the tables while we just say, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in the silence of our hearts, Lord, we confess our sin, known and unknown, our thoughts, our words, our actions. Lord, we need you. And it's only through your son, Jesus, who lived, who died, who rose again and sends his Holy Spirit to live in us where we can even approach this meal. At your invitation, though, you say, come. And so we examine our hearts right now. Forgive us, renew us, lead us. And if there's anything specific that the Holy Spirit may bring to mind here this morning. We ask that you would hear our prayer now, even as we confess that in the silence of this moment. Whoever you are, wherever you have been, know this, that Almighty God, in his love and in his mercy, has given Jesus to die for you, and for his sake, he has forgiven you all of your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. If you believe that, say amen. 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 Hey, we're going to come forward to receive communion today, but first, our first communion families, you're going to come gather up here and uh, our elders are going to come as well. So come on, stand on up and come on down. Yep. And you'll gather as families up here. You're going to receive communion first. And then the rest of us will, will follow in four continuous lines. And our frontline teams are going to help us move around the room. You can hold out your hand to receive a piece of bread. All of our bread is gluten-free. And then the second person at each station will have a tray. The outer ring of darker colored cups is alcoholic wine. And for those who wish not to have a non-alcoholic preference, there's grape juice and the lighter color cups in the center of each tray. If you get up here and you forget that, that's fine. Just ask. All right, we're here to serve you. Uh, so this is Christ's meal that he invites us to. And so come for the table is ready.
stand together. The precious love of Christ given out for us on the cross because of this meal. And it is because of him alone that we have a future, that we have something beyond this world to look forward to. And he took on our flesh, broke himself for us when we didn't deserve it. And so we say, thank you, Lord. And we sing praise as we live lives in response. Let's sing this beautiful modern hymn in Christ alone. Let's lift this boldly as one body. Found. 
together as we profess our faith in the words of the Apostles Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. 
He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Now may this true sacramental gift of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, may it sustain you today and forever in life and faith everlasting. Amen. As we enter a time of prayer today, we borrow the words of David in Psalm chapter 4. He cries out, he says, answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. You have given me relief when I was in distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. And so we pray, Lord, however we walked in here today, whatever it is we're thinking about right now, we're feeling right now, we're experiencing, you hear our prayer, Lord. In our distress, in our trouble, You hear our prayer. Lord, you are not far from us. You are not dependent on our righteousness, on our efforts, on us being good enough for our prayer to be heard. And so, Lord, in this time, I ask that the prayer on every heart in this space that gathers around you today would know that in your mercy, you hear their prayer. Lord, today we want to pray for those who are suffering, those who are sick, those who need healing, those who are experiencing brokenness in ways that are complicated and complex. God, we pray for healing, for restoration. We pray more than anything that your presence would be known, that you're not a God that's far off, but you're a God that longs to be compassionate, that longs to sit with us through the difficulties of life. In good times and bads, Lord, you are there and you're with us. And so, Lord, I pray that your presence would be sensed and felt. I pray for our church, God, that you would unite us together in you alone, in the cross alone. God, I pray that um, all the other opinions we have, thoughts we have, ideas, that you would help us find unity, not in those things, but in you. Because in you lies hope, restoration, peace, joy, and new life, Lord. And the disciples, Lord, when they came to you, seeking that new life which you give, and that way in which you showed them. And they asked, how should we pray? Together we pray those words that you taught them. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Today, as we continue in worship, we'd love to connect with you. We have some connection cards in your pews. They're these white um, pieces of cardstock. And uh, if you are new around here, or maybe you've just kind of been hanging, right? loitering and back, but you're like, hey, I think, I think the Spirit is leading me and saying like, hey, I need to do something. I need to be connected with the body of Christ more. Um, you could fill one of those out, and we'd love to talk with you about that and help you get connected and what God's up to in this community of believers. On the back side, there's a prayer request um, space there, and we'd love you to share a prayer with us, whatever's on your heart right now today. It would be our honor 
as a staff to just pray alongside you. Not that um, your prayer is going to get like supersized or like, you know, spe- over, more, even more special or anything like that. But just as a fellow, fellow believers, we'd love to just pray your prayers with you um, and to minister to you that in that way. And so if you'd like to do that, you can um, put those cards in the boxes and back. If you'd like to worship the Lord today with an offering, there's a few ways you can do that. You can do that um, through the app. You can do it online. You can do it um, <clears throat> the analog way. And you can put those in the boxes and back as well. And when we give of offering, it's an act of worship. It's an act of saying, Lord, I, I know you love me. I trust you and how you provide for me and your goodness. And, uh, and so it's something that we just freely do. It's not an obligation thing um, that it's, you must do this. That is, uh, that's not the way of the Lord in that. And so, but if you'd like to do that, those are the ways you can participate in offering here today and to worship the Lord in that way. Also, the holidays aren't far away. I know, I heard a lot of cringing. Uh, Don't worry, there's still weeks to come. So every week, you you know, there's another opportunity to lower your anxiety levels about that or increase them. There's not really, uh, you know, one way that goes. But the holidays are coming. Uh, And one of the things we love to do around here is to be generous through a program called Giving Tree. And it's a way to bless others during the Christmas season. Um, and if that's something that uh, you know somebody or, or yourself could be blessed by that, uh, we'd love to connect with you on that. And you can find out more information at oslc.com slash giving tree. And uh, that's a great place to, to start. And we're really excited for what God is going to continue to do here throughout the holiday season. But I'm done talking about the holiday season. I'm not here to induce any more stress as we enter our message time today. So check out the kids' message. Good morning, everyone. My name is Kerry Hoff, and I want to welcome you to this week's kids' message. This month, we've been looking at a lot of different ways that we can show self-control. And we've seen stories in the Bible of people who have showed self-control in some tough situations. Today, we're looking at some of the famous sayings of one of the wisest people who ever lived, King Solomon. And he happened to mention self-control quite a few times. Like in this verse, Proverbs 25, 16. Check it out. If you find honey, eat just enough. If you eat too much of it, you will throw up. Who knew the Bible would ever mention throwing up? You know, that reminds me of a time when I was much, much younger and I thought it would be a good idea to drink a whole gallon of milk. Now for the record, I do not recommend this. Milk is way too expensive and nobody needs that much milk at one time. Now, despite all of this, I tried it anyways because I lacked self-control. All I had available to me were those small, school-sized milk cartons. It's best if you don't ask why. And after some quick math, I discovered it took 16 small, school-sized milk cartons to make a gallon. So I drank the first carton, and then the next, and the next, and the next. And I can tell you that I was successful in drinking a whole gallon of milk, but it did not go well for me. Let's just say King Solomon was right about having too much. Maybe you don't have a problem eating too much honey or drinking too much milk, but I think King Solomon was talking about more than just about what we eat and drink. He was talking about the wisdom of knowing when to stop and choosing to have self-control. Maybe a little bit of honey is great, but you don't wanna have too much of a good thing. There are usually some not so great consequences when you do. Have you ever taken a joke too far with someone and it hurt their feelings? Have you ever played so hard that you ran out of energy before the end of the game? Or have you ever lost track of time on a phone or device and didn't do what you needed to do? 
This brings us to our bottom line for today, and it is know when to stop. You see, there's a time and place for everything, and with the help of God and the help of others around us, we can be wise and have self-control and enjoy the many good things in our lives. Let's pray. You can repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for all the good things in my life. Please help me to make wise choices and share your love with others. In Jesus' name, amen. For more Bible fun, videos about today's lesson, or conversation starters for your family, head to the section called Kids Connect at Home in today's Kids News email. All right, kids, it's time to head to Kids Connect, so find your leaders in orange shirts at the back, and have a great week, everyone. Good morning. I'm reading from John chapter 8, verses 31 through 36. That's page 894 in your pew Bible. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are offspring of Abraham, and have never been a slave to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Calvin. Hey, if you've been tracking with us throughout this sermon series of Faith That Works, you can fill this sentence in, all right? A faith that works invites us where? Into, anyone help me? Into the life of Jesus. Let's say that together. A faith that works invites us into the life of Jesus. And all, all throughout this series, we've been looking at ways that through the Holy Spirit, we are invited to live out our faith through the life of Jesus. And so, uh, Today, we get to talk about forgiveness, and when we put faith and forgiveness together, it, it can get complex really, really quickly, and it's because we have this element of human choice, right? Human choice. We're free to forgive, but we're also free to not forgive or to withhold forgiveness or to harbor unforgiveness, and what we're going to discover in these verses is that Jesus is going to help us unpack and discover how we have the freedom to forgive, what holds us back from that forgiveness, and how there's really only one way forward when it comes to living in that freedom that we have to forgive. And so let's pray and we'll get into God's word. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We ask that now your Holy Spirit would would speak. Uh, Lord, it's not just the words on this page uh, like the reformers 500 some years ago would say, um, Lord, it's the person that these words point to. And so, Lord, may we see Jesus. That's all we want to see is may we see Jesus in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, so here, here's the truth I'm going to start off with, all right, that we have the freedom to forgive. We have the freedom to forgive. And this is how Jesus puts this, all right? We're going to apply these words to forgiveness. Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him. So he's speaking to people who have an orientation toward who God is, that God created them, that God loves them, that God is for them, not against them. So, so they have that orientation. They have that perspective already. He's not talking to atheists. He's not talking to agnostics. He's not talking to people who have many gods. Uh, these are people who, who believe that there is only one true God, the God of Abraham. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all right? But there are also people who have come to what? Believe in him, which, which means that they've also come to the point of saying, he is the Messiah. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He's the one who was and is and is to come. He's the one who has come to rescue God's people. He is the plan of God's salvation, and so there's this relationship between the hearers here of what Jesus is about to say and their hearts. And so they're open. They're, they're ready to receive what Jesus has to say. And this is what he says. If you what? Abide. Abide, Abide where? In my word, then you're truly what? My disciples. 
And if you're my disciples, that means you've learned what I've taught you. You're putting it into practice. You are, you, you've got it. You, you've caught it. You, you, know, you know my way, all right? And when you do that, you will know what? The truth. Of course, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So in other words, you will know me. And that truth, by knowing me, will do what? It will set you free. You'll have freedom. You'll have, have true freedom. Now, I want to go back to this word abide. Everybody say abide. 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 It, it means to, to live in, to hold on to, to stay, to dwell to wait in for the purpose of expecting something in the future, not just for the purpose of doing this abiding, but for the purpose of expecting something, something that is not yet here, something that you do not yet know. You're waiting, you're living in, you're holding on to something that is yet to come. It's the same word John uses when he describes how the Holy Spirit in Jesus' baptism, and yours and mine, by the way, where God the Father sends his Holy Spirit and it remained or abided in Jesus and you. That it rests, that it dwells, that it waits, that it grows, that it expects something in the future that we do not yet know. And so, so catch what Jesus is saying here. All right? Jesus is saying that the only way to be free, the only way for the truth to set you free is how? By abiding where? In my word. To wait, to, to, to live in my ways. That's the only way you're going to be free, which, which kind of is an interesting definition because it flies in the face of how we understand freedom today, right? After all, we are in an election season, right? There's a lot of messaging about freedom. And freedom today is oftentimes defined as personal autonomy, isn't it? Like, you do your thing, I'll do my thing, and, you know, you can't tell me what to do. It's kind of like, you know, we're a bunch of preschoolers. And and so, so the less boundaries, the less limitations, the more personal autonomy we have to do the things I want to do, to say the things I want to say, to to live the way I want to live means that I have more freedom. That's how we would define freedom in today's context. Or to put it in the words of Alphaba in Wicked, we want to be unlimited. But you see, to be free, to have complete autonomy flies in the face of the definition of freedom that Jesus is placing in front of us here today. That it's not about being autonomous. It's not about doing what you want, when you want it, how you want it, where you want it, however you want it. It's actually something altogether different. It's ditching the wrong ways for the right ways. It's ditching my way for Jesus' way. It's it's abiding not in my ways, but in Jesus' way, which means only by that we are known to be his disciples, and we will know Jesus, the truth, and that knowing Jesus and him alone will what? Set us free. Free to forgive. Free to love free to serve, free to obey. And you see, see, it's, it feels a little counterintuitive because we think that freedom is this lack of boundaries, but actually Jesus is saying it's not the lack of boundaries, it's, it's the reestablishment of my boundary, of my way, of my limitations, of my direction, which is really hard, isn't it? Because again, like preschoolers, we don't want to be told what to do, Right? Nobody wants to be told what to do. So what holds us back? What, what motivates us? What, what creates that resistance to Jesus' way? Well, Jesus goes on and, and explains how sometimes we think, well, it's, it's the world out there that, that makes us that way, right? World is evil. I'm, you know, for the most part, pretty good. And so it's the world that's tempting me, Right? Or we could say it's the devil that's, that's doing the deed. And while, while there's truth to that, this is what Jesus says. All right? They, this is again the Jews who believed in them, they, they responded, hey, uh, what do you mean we're enslaved? We're, 
we're offspring of Abraham and we've never been enslaved to anyone. We're, we're, we're free, we're autonomous. How is it that you can say we'll become free? Why, Jesus, why are you implying that somehow we're not free? And Jesus said to him, them, let's say it together, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. Catch what Jesus is saying? It's not coming from the outside. Sin's coming from the inside. Sin's not coming from the outside. Sin's coming from the inside. That the cause of our own slavery, the the reason we harbor unforgiveness, the reason we struggle with living in Jesus' way is the sin in our own human heart. We say, nobody can tell me what to do. And what happens is that sin, it actually doesn't only hurt the people around us, like an army attack with all the shrapnel and and you have innocent bystanders, but it actually breaks us. It hurts us. It kills us. To the point where we actually become less free. We become less humane. That we become more enslaved to ourselves because what happens is that we have to feed it. Let's just take take unforgiveness for, for an example. We have to feed that bitterness. We have to feed that anger. We have to feed that motivation. We have to feed it. And if it's not fed, we become angry. We begin to self justify. We become self righteous because we feel more and more restricted. And what happens is, is while that's going on the inside, on the outside, we become more of like a taker than a giver. We become more judgmental than grace-filled. That's what holds us back. It's not from the outside, it's from the inside. And if that's the case, then the way we discover the freedom to forgive, like Jesus forgives, then there's only one solution. Check it out. This is what Jesus says next. The slave does not remain in the house forever, but rather, who remains forever? The son. So if the son sets you free, let's read this last phrase, you will be free indeed. Catch what Jesus is saying here. He's saying it really comes down to this question. How do you see the son? Jesus Christ. Because if you see him as an employer, Tim Keller talks about this. If you see him as an employer, you're going to see his word as a bunch of policies or a bunch of laws that you have to follow. Do this. Don't do that. And so Jesus' way just becomes kind of this sense of, well, I got to do this so I don't get that cause and effect, which is perfectly rational. But catch what Jesus is saying here. He's talking about how the slave does not remain where? In the house forever, but the who, who remains forever? The son remains forever. What's he getting at? Um, well, if, if this is just a job, if being a Christian, if living out your faith, a faith that works is just a job that we do, then yeah, it's all based on your behavior. And what you do matters, and what you don't do matters, and it will determine whether or not you're in the house or out of the house. It will determine whether or not you're part of the family or not part of the family. It determines whether or not you belong or you don't belong. But that's not what Jesus says, is it? Jesus says, if the Son sets you free, then what? You will be what? Free indeed. He's saying that because the Son sets you free, because Jesus lived and died and rose again for you and for me, for the sins of the world, that we're not we don't have this employee-employer relationship with God. He's not, he's not our boss. He's not our supervisor. No, he's our parent. More specifically, he's our father. Which means that we're part of the family. Long before we've ever asked for forgiveness. Long before we even knew we needed to be forgiven. While we were still sinners, Jesus, anyone know? Died for us. 
And you see, Jesus is saying that we can try harder or you can do better, but trying harder or doing better or still trying to figure out your own way is still being a slave to yourself. You're still enslaving your own heart and you have to feed it and you're gonna feed it more and you're gonna end up burying yourself, killing yourself from the inside out. And so the only way to be free, the only way to forgive, the only way forward is to see God not as someone who gives you his word so that you can walk the straight line. But like the reformers some 500 years ago, the word points to Jesus and Jesus alone. Because Jesus is the one who died for our sin. Jesus is the one who freed our human hearts. Jesus is the one who set the way. Jesus is the one who invites us back into the relationship with God. Jesus is the one who sets us free and who the son sets free, he is what? free indeed, free to love him. We don't have to, but we get to. Free to serve. We don't have to, we get to. Free to obey. We don't have to, but we get to. You see the difference? The difference in how we see the sun determines how we live in freedom, and especially when it comes to the forgiveness of our sins. Now, how, how can we say all that? Well, you have to go down to the end of the chapter. Go down to the end of chapter 8, and uh, I'm going to be down in verse 58. Jesus said to the same group of people, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, are you there with me? Last two words, one, two, three, I am. Anyone remember this story? Moses He's walking in the wilderness. He's out tending sheep. And our elders are working through this book called The Fire of the Presence of God, A.W. Tozer. It's a, f- it's a phenomenal book. Um, and so Moses, he's out there, and God finds Moses. And this bush lights up. And anyone remember when Moses asked the question, so who are you? Remember what God names himself? I am. It's a holy moment. It's a moment when God touches humanity, when God touches Moses, and and Jesus is saying, when you forgive, when you live in freedom, that's yours through the power of the Holy Spirit, it's a holy moment that God is with you, that you're on holy ground, Before Abraham was, I am. And Jesus is saying, I am. I am God. The same one that was in the burning bush who was absolutely and totally free. And just like Jesus, God sends his Holy Spirit to give you and me complete and utter forgiveness. To live in us, to rest in us, to hold us, to abide in us. It's that same Holy Spirit that leads Jesus to give up his freedom on the cross. Think about this. He could have came down, but he chose not to. He gave up his freedom even to move. Why? So that you and I can be completely forgiven. To have the freedom to forgive others. I don't know if you've ever thought of it that way, but this passage here, it's truly remarkable how it changes our perspective when it comes to not just the freedom that we have, but the forgiveness that we have to give to ourselves, to others, to the world. So I want to invite you to stand. As we close out, band's going to come up. Um, As you stand, just just a question. Um, You know the blessing that God wants to give to us through this freedom? (laughs) Through the forgiveness of sins, you know what the blessing is? Sure, it's it's peace that surpasses all understanding. Sure, it's the promise of eternal life. Yes, it is the assurance that God is with us. But it's the promise the reformers brought us back to 500 years ago. That we get Jesus. And that's all we need. Christ alone. He is our peace, who freely forgives us so that you and I, we can freely forgive others. 
And so we can know the truth, and the truth will set us free. So look to him. Hold on to him. Abide in him. As you leave this place, know that he goes with you. So Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, may we do just that. That you are the one in the burning bush who appears so freely to Moses, that you're the one who is the way, the truth, and the life, who so freely gives yourself to us. Lord, that even you gave up your freedom on the cross so that we can be free to love and serve and obey and forgive others. Lord, may we rest in that freedom. Would you free us from the enslavement of our own hearts? Lord, as we battle the addictions, Lord, as we battle our own sin, our own pride, our own ways, Lord, may we continually cast off our ways for yours. So, Lord, send your Holy Spirit, and may that be so. In Jesus' name, amen. Shine upon you and be great.
serve the Lord. <laughs>